Thank you so much, Diana. Diana has been such a generous collaborator and inspiration, providing photographs and other materials to the archives, as well as encouragement. So have the Roonies, Winifred's great-grandchildren, as well as Eaton scholars around the world, such as Karen Skenazi, Dominica Ferenc, Jennifer Harris, and Sean Hunter. RAs from the past and the present. I notice a few RAs calling in today from years ago. Um, and of course, the University of Calgary's uh, special collections. And not to forget Serena Patterson, our web designer extraordinaire. So we're grateful for all the contributions that these people have made to the archive. Diana is right about the Winniers being a fabulous group of people. I'm now going to invite Jean Lee Cole, author of Literary Voices of Winifred Eaton and the senior consultant on the archive to talk about the original Winifred Eaton digital archive that she built and its relationship to our new archive. Jean? Thanks, Mary. And it's so exciting to see um, all these people who I've kind of known for so long and, and not so long. Um, this, I just can't believe this is happening, honestly. Um, but this is a project that um, really started in the early 1990s. Um, I started doing research on uh, Winnie, as we like to call her, um, when I was decided to work on her for my dissertation when I was a grad student at the University of Texas at Austin. And what really attracted me to her was that she was the bad sister. I guess I was kind of rebellious at the time. And I thought, you know, everybody's talking about Edith all the time. We need to, you know, give Winifred some attention. And, um, and I was also really struck by the fact that she was clearly so much more successful, commercially successful than, um, than Edith. So, um, so I started looking for her work and Diana and um, the University of Calgary were very, very generous in, in helping me locate a bunch of these works. But um, I also saw, we, Diana and I talked a lot about how there were all these reference to, references to things that she'd written that had not been located. And, um, and this was before uh, really, you know, this was before digital scanning even. Um, it was just paper and microfilm. And, um, and I basically spent the next 10 years, every time I was in an archive somewhere, spent many hours at the Library of Congress, just um, paging uh, through, you know, through microfilm, paging through dusty old volumes of magazines and journals, um, just looking for these stories and other publications that I only knew the title of. Um, and then in the process of that, I ended up finding over a hundred works um, altogether. Many of them um, were works that we actually did not even have titles for. I just happened to encounter them because they were in the same magazines where she had published something else. Um, so those were the works that actually became the first Winifred Eaton digital archive, which um, was established in 2004. And it really was uh, enabled by the ETAC Center at the University of Virginia, uh, much beloved and uh, missed. Um, and a, a, a whole stable of graduate students there uh, encoded and transcribed. Well, I, I guess I transcribed a lot of them. But anyway, um, worked on the text, got them into TEI, um, and created this digital um, archive, um, which only lasted for about four years. And then the eTech Center was disbanded. Um, it was closed. And so all the texts that we had worked on were dispersed into the University of Virginia library collection. But all of the uh, editorial apparatus that I had developed um, just disappeared. Um, in fact, they had um, they, they told me the eTech Center was closing and they they sent me a zip file with all of the files and that, that was all I had left. Um, so, the, so the archive, the demise of the first archive was a very sad moment for me. Um, and I discovered later that it was just one of many, many projects, um, early recovery projects from the 1990s and early 2000s that had suffered the same fate. Um, and so some of you might remember Ellen Liu's Voice of the Shuttle website or Sharon Harris's Early American Women's website um, and also Voices from the Gaps. These are all websites that really help to support um, scholarship and teaching in women writers and, and underrepresented um, writers. And 
you know, with the development of digital humanities um, and the development of different kinds of infrastructures that required lots more resources, both technological and human, um, you know, people like us who just had done, uh, done these little small scale projects um, couldn't uh, sustain the projects that we had developed. Um, and I just want to mention Amy Earhart, who um, wrote about all of our projects and, and talked about the ways that um, institutionalization of digital humanities has actually ironically um, undercut um, recovery work. And so this is one of the reasons why I think um, this resuscitated archive is so exciting because maybe it shows that there's a shift back toward um, recovery work. So I really am so thrilled uh, that Mary came along and said, you know, we need to bring this archive back to life. And at the time, um, I recall Mary and I both said, we cannot let this take over our lives. Do you remember that, Mary? <laughs> and, Famous last words. <laughs> um, and we've spent about the last uh, two years, I guess, um, the majority of the last two years, not us really, M Mary mostly, um, creating this wonderful archive that has so surpassed anything that I had hoped for or dreamed of. Um, and so it's really great to be able to celebrate it with all of you. And thanks a lot for giving me a chance to wax nostalgic. Thank you, Jean. So Winifred produced a much larger oeuvre than originally acknowledged, as Jean just mentioned. Now we think she has uh, over 300 texts that we need to deal with. And we continue to locate and attribute new texts to her all the time. She published novels, short stories, film, screenplays, poems, autobiographical prose, ethnography, a cookbook. Um, she wrote under many pseudonyms, and she also cut across subject positions, geographies, national borders, and ideological stances that shift with her own adopted identities. So in digitizing, transcribing, and archiving her messy oeuvre, the Winifred Eaton Archive team was forced to grapple with her multiplicity, both as a writer of color whose work traverses genres and forms, and as an author whose subjectivity fluctuates across space and time, disrupting the single author model that many DH scholars rely on when they build an archive. Indeed, her complicated career resists simple encoding approaches and digitization technologies, demanding much more flexible and adaptable ontologies to attend to her complexities as a biracial, non-canonical author and as a Chinese-Canadian woman masquerading as Japanese. So I'm going to screen share now and um, okay can everybody see the uh, archive I'm looking at now yes just nod or give me the thumbs up somebody yes okay thank you so um, I want to give you a quick tour. Our first challenge was deciding how to organize her oeuvre produced over a nearly 50 year career. We decided to organize the text into exhibits. So there are kind of five exhibits here that roughly correspond to the periods in her career. So early experiments uh, features texts written in the 1890s and early 1900s during Eaton's writing apprenticeship in Montreal and Jamaica and or before she took up her identity as Anato Watana. So you can see some poetry, a story about uh, Chinese uh, in Montreal and a few other stories. Um, the second section has text that you will be more familiar with. It's the plain Japanese phase uh, that uh, written on Japanese subjects and themes from 1896 to 1922. Um, we found her very first uh, Japanese text, which has a really great preamble by the editor about her, her identity that I really recommend you look at. That's a Japanese girl. 
Um, the transcriptions and encoding for these two exhibits is com are complete and we're launching them today. Now the final three exhibits are New York Years, which uh, features texts marking a period of reinvention from 1901 to 1916, after the novelty of her Japanese romances had faded. Um, Alberta, which will collect texts written about her Western ranch country, uh, written about Western ranch country during her years living off and on in Alberta, uh, roughly uh, from her marriage to Frank Reeve in 1917 until her death. This is a period in which she's championing Canadian literature um, and uh, community theater. And then the final phase of her career in Hollywood collects her screenplays, uh, film treatments, uh, we're looking for surviving films, as well as fiction that she wrote about the movie business, uh, roughly between 1916 when she won a screenplay writing contest to 1935 when it appears she uh, she left or she stopped working for Hollywood. So I want to go to one section and sort of show you how it works. Um, in addition to there being a kind of introduction here, we have um, a list of texts. They can be sorted uh, chronologically or alphabetically. And each text includes, I'm just going to go to one uh, that's kind of a good example. Each text includes a facsimile that you can click on and it will expand and be kind of a good size and, um, and uh, transcription here. Um, it also uh, includes some metadata that might be of interest to you. So if there's a a dotted line under the name of the illustrator. You can click on it and go to the biography of the illustrator. You can see what he uh, contributed as illustrations, which text he contributed to. Um, you can also click on the publisher and go to the periodical and see uh, a definition or an info about the periodical and then a list of the texts uh, that he published in that periodical. Um, there are also, for some texts, peer-reviewed headnotes. So here's one written by one of the RAs uh, from the summer, who's not able to be here right now. Um, team members who are on the call will tell you a little bit about writing, writing those headnotes in a minute. And if you click on credits and citations, you see a sort of full acknowledgement of who contributed to various phases, who did some of the work. There's also some code that can be downloaded and our technical director, Joey Takeda, will tell you more about that in a moment. Also want to show you the timeline. We had a lot of fun with this because um, the biographical research that was done by Diana and Dominica Ferens and Annette White Parks about the Eaton family was done before the, there was sort of more digital searching, Ancestry.com, Newspapers.com. So we've been able to add significantly to the biography, correcting some, you know, misstatements or omissions, and um, we've illustrated it. So there are posters of the uh, Chinese acrobatic troupe her mother belonged to. There are photographs of uh, most of her siblings. There are some census, um, census pages. Um, sorry if I'm making you dizzy just scrolling through, but I'm sort of trying to give you a sense of um, she posed as a model in the Brooklyn Eagle fashion pages. So we have a photo of that, some photos from her uh, Japanese Nightingale uh, stage adaptation, Mark Twain's birthday party, some family photos from Alberta and California, and then some later photos from, from Alberta with her 
and Universal Studios, um, Canadian Authors Association, etc. So that timeline just continues to grow all the time as we um, learn more about uh, Winifred. Under resources, or uh, the other thing under the biography is we've um, built a file that sort of feeds all the pseudonym information so you can see which author tag she used and then which texts are associated with that. And under resources we've got a complete uh, bibliography of her work in chronological order. We've got secondary scholarship on uh, Winifred, which we're always adding to. So if you notice that something you've done is missing from this list, we'd love to hear from you. And there's also a list that sort of interfaces with those artist bios that I was telling you about. Here's a list of all her collaborators and we've got um, bios for some of them. That's a, a sort of pro, uh, project we're working on. Okay, so the team is going to show you, tell you more. I'm going to stop screen sharing now and I'm going to pass uh, the mic to PhD student and project manager Sydney Lines to say more about the challenges presented by having so much material to work with and how we managed uh, dealing with it all. Okay, thanks, Mary. Um, I'm going to screen share really quickly. Let's see. Everybody can see it? Thumbs up? Okay. So for some people, this might be the boring part um, because it's sort of the back end of what things look like. But the thing I really like about DH projects is how collaborative they are. Um, and I think for humanities people, we tend to have this idea that it's all about the end product, but there's so much that goes into making these things that I've sort of wanted to show like what are the what are the challenges that we um, had to face and then how did that also um, change the way we were thinking about the project. So uh, this this is just a screenshot of what the Google Drive looks like in the background. Um, there are a lot of things in this Google Drive that are not on the archive um, but it's a way of, of showing sort of where the the project was when um, Joey and I first came on to which I think was like November 2018. Um, there are pictures, there are um, unpublished manuscripts, there are scrapbook pieces, there are all sorts of things that are associated with Winifred, um, and that's sort of tracked here. Plus there's also um, texts that we got from things like Jean Lee Cole's original archives. So we're dealing with almost 20 years of information here, lots of people who have cycled in and out of the project, uh, and just needing a kind of repository to put all those things so uh, this is a snapshot and um, this is just one look. There's more folders within each of these folders too. So we had to deal with uh, the issue of how do we manage the tasks associated with each te a text. So this is the original spreadsheet we had um, and we were trying to track things but also create a list of tasks that we could manage since we had a team of four or five people and we weren't all in the same location either. Um, and then just to think about like what is it that we were actually tracking so we had to track phases of editing who was encoding who was transcribing um, who was actually publishing it when did we check it off to say that it was published we were tracking her collaborators uh, so those are those artists we were talking about or co-authors um, we also were trying to track what are the sources we had so many sources for these works whether it was project gutenberg or library archives or eaton family members who contributed um, we wanted to make sure that we we had the correct sources uh, listed for those as well. We also had links to facsimiles, we had illustrations, and then tons of ephemera associated with either the text or um, ephemera that's associated with things like stage productions or film stills or even just um, Eaton family photos. And so we've sort of realized that this text uh, spreadsheet became kind of unwieldy and also didn't do all the things that we needed it to do. But it was a really good exercise for us because what it revealed is that um, the Winifred Eaton archive sort of needed to happen in phases and that we needed to plan for the long haul as well. Um, so the something like the ephemera we knew we were not going to be able to attend to in phase one, but that biographical timeline is a bit of a nod to um, what could potentially be possible in the next phases of this project. So we moved everything over to Asana and what you're looking at here uh, in this top screenshot is just 
the landing page for the archive. So each of these are sort of individual projects associated with the overall project and we're in texts here. So each of these texts has um, subtasks and you can assign these to people. You can also ask questions, post updates, ask clarifying information. You can add collaborators. Uh, there's all sorts of things you can do with Asana and it creates a historical record for um, things like conversations when you have when you have people who are cycling out of a project, you um, you can tr sort of track the conversations you've had, even if they're done, you always have that historical record. So Asana allowed us to have more detailed task management um, through each of the individual phases. You could assign these different tasks to various collaborators and see what everyone was doing. Um, it's more collaborative in the sense that you can have the conversation there. You can still link all of your Google documents here um, and then with so many people cycling in and out of the project, we just needed a more sustainable way to manage tasks and phases. Um, and that seems like a, a good moment to turn things over to Daisy and Sija, who are two RAs who are just coming off the project now. I'm not sure who wants to go first. I'm happy to go first, Sydney. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my name is Daisy and I just uh, graduated from my undergrad uh, in which I did a double major in English Lit and Psychology at UBC. And I worked with the archive um, this summer, so from about May to the end of August. And I worked mostly on texts from the New York years, like um, Neighbor's Garden or The Diary of Delia, um, but also some other work throughout, because as Sydney pointed out, there's a huge amount of work to get done. Um, and, and she had great organization, but we were all kind of chipping in to help where we could. Uh, and working on the archive, I had the opportunity to learn a lot of the technical skills, like how to use OCR scanning software to create an editable transcript of a text, or the basics of coding and the text encoding language we, um, we used to actually build the archive, and then how to encode texts in Oxygen so all of the information that Mary showed you is there and the archive is as useful as possible. You know, so tagging quotations and paratextual elements uh, or foreign languages. And I'd always before been quite intimidated by the amount of technical skill that goes into digital humanities projects, but this was a really fun and accessible way to actually learn those skills and make it feel like digital humanities can be possible, even if you're not super confident in it. Uh, and I also learned a lot of non-tech skills, like how to proofread really fast and accurately, how to write a peer-reviewed headnote, which was a really exciting opportunity. Um, and the current landscape of scholarship on Canadian and American lit. Uh, it was a really, really great supplement to my degree uh, and actually let me apply all of those skills that you know you develop throughout your undergrad but usually don't have the opportunity to use in even a semi-professional environment. Um, yeah, so I've really enjoyed working on the archive. It was a really great way to be introduced to um, Winifred Eden as well. I'd never heard of her before. And getting to explore the archive in all these ways was such an engaging and active way to learn about her and her work. Uh, yeah, it was a great summer and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I'll pass it on to CJ now to talk more. Hi everyone, my name is Sija and I am an MA student at UBC. It's a great pleasure to be part of this project and have a chance to try many new things. I transcribed and encoded text, I learned TEI and many other digital humanities skills and Daisy just mentioned. And I also got to try a new genre and write a peer reviewed headnote for Johnny's Cough and Pascal, a very raw and sensational text about life in Alberta. And during the summer, I worked mostly on texts from Eden's Japanese romances and her Alberta years. And I really liked how through her self-orientalism and a masquerade, her seemingly stereotypical yet subversive Japanese heroines reflect, ref, reflects Eden's own conflicted subjectivity. I really enjoyed working on such a bold and fascinating early Asian North American women writer. And I really wish people would like this special digital archive for a very unconventional writer that is Winifred Eaton. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Zija. That's great. So the head notes were double blind peer reviewed by anonymous reviewers. And ultimately, we hope that each text in the archive will be accompanied by a head note. Uh, many of you have volunteered to write one. We'll be in touch soon about that. And we invite anyone on the call today to peruse the archive and let us know if there's a particular text that intrigues you that you'd like to work on. You can even message me and tell me what 
you're working on, what themes, and I can point you to some texts that might um, relate to, you, to the research you're doing. Okay, finally, I'd like to introduce you to Joey Takeda. He's the technical director for the archive, and he's currently a user interface developer at Simon Fraser University's Digital Humanities Innovation Lab. Joey will explain more of the technical aspects of the archive. Thanks, uh, Mary, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, like Mary said, I'm, uh, I began at the archive around the same time Sydney did, um, and uh, I worked uh, primarily on creating sort of the technical infrastructure for the project. We had a few ideas of what we were going to do, um, but we ended up creating a, uh, using Gene's um, TEI text as sort of a base, uh, creating a, a robust TEI schema and everything for the for the archive to be built. Um, so one of the most um, exciting parts about the Winifred Eaton archive, or at least what I find really exciting, is that the site is completely archivable and sustainable. So it's built with no special server-side processing. Um, it's not built with a pre-existing platform, so it's not WordPress or it's not a Mecca or anything like that. Um, we built it uh, with a sort of a bespoke code, um, which at one point, uh, which at one one sense seems less sustainable. Um, but the way in which the site is built is that it's built as a static website, meaning that all of the pages that you see on the Winifred Eaton Archive are pre-built um, and just exist as simple HTML pages. So no different from the websites from 1997, the first sort of websites that were uh, uh, existed that still exist today. Um, so we know that digital archives are can be fragile um, or, and at least be traditionally sort of subject to funding, et cetera. Um, so like Gene's earlier incarnation of the Winifred Eaton Archive, the site can be zipped up and emailed. Um, but unlike that earlier zip file, that, uh, that collection can actually be deployed on any server in any library archive um, with all features, everything linked together, all pair text, all uh, search functions, everything. Um, so this sounds sort of like a utopic or maybe overly optimistic sort of way in which to see the archive, um, but it is totally, um, totally sustainable and totally built with these sort of uh, long-term preservation in mind. Um, so one thing that I'd like to show today, uh, apart from sort of the technical infrastructure, um, is the uh, search capacities that we've been able to build into the site. Um, again, with static sites, often the searching searching can be a real problem in static sites because you don't have a complicated sort of server process in which to run those queries. Um, but for this website, we've been able to build um, it with consul in consultation with some colleagues at the University of Victoria, build a completely archivable and sustainable search engine as well. Um, and what that means is that our search engine is also um, customized for to, to work with uh, the complicated sort of body of work that Winifred presents. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see. Can everybody see my screen here? Uh, let me just zoom. Let me see here. Sorry. Uh, everybody can see the screen all right? Great. Um, so let me move things down. Sorry. Move that over. So with the archive right now, you have the traditional search button right at the top. Um, and that can allow you to do something like just look up a text. So if you type in garden, you can find a neighbor's garden and it will lead you there. But you can also search the archive entirely for a phrase like garden. So here is the, is the uh, search term for garden. And you can see Winifred, uh, uh, the word garden appears in 74 documents. Um, and you can see that she uses gardens quite often. Uh, this is initially sorted by relevance, um, but you can look for uh, documents which use the word garden more. Um, often these are novels because novels are going to just contain more words statistically. Um, but you can also look for her earliest instance of garden. So she uses garden in her very first Japanese text, uh, a Japanese girl. Um, you can also look for the latest instance when she's the word garden, um, which is cattle. 
But you can also combine these with a little bit more complicated searches. So uh, here we have a search for garden and some spelling of samurai. Um, you can use asterisks for wild cards, um, so zero or more characters. You can use question marks for a, a possible character. Um, in order to sort of work with the complex spelling and shifting sort of spelling conventions that um, exists throughout uh, Winifred's archive. So here's where you can look for various spellings of samurai um, and can help kind of track these sort of terms. Um, but combined with these queries, you can also do uh, combine them with filters. And the filters is a really exciting part uh, because the filters allow us to um, sort of curate a subset of Winifred's collection that you might be interested in. So you want to look at how many times she uses the word garden uh, in text published after 1920, which you can do. Um, and you can see that she publishes a number of texts that talk about gardens afterwards, including Sunny San, her last Japanese novel. Um, but you can also just use the filters by themselves in order to uh, again, create sort of a subset or a curated collection of documents to ask, um, at either answer or ask questions about her archive. Uh, so here's, for instance, a published document published from 1925 that used the pseudonym Winifred Reeve, Winifred Eaton, Winifred Eaton Reeve, or Winifred Reeve. Um, so this allows us to ask all sorts of questions about her archive, trace her development in ways, and it doesn't prioritize um, one set of texts over the other, but allows you to sort of ask questions across the entire archive. Um, all of these searches are available on the site and you can find um, a sort of uh, instructions on how to use the various searches and what's possible um, uh, uh, just below the, below the search button there. Um, so our hope is that in this digital infrastructure that's also quite, that's hopefully robust and hopefully sustainable, is that the Winifred Eaton Archive will be able to support and foster the new questions and answers to the various critical and historical problems that Eaton's complex body of work generates. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Joey. Um, a lot of the technical information about the site is under the about option in the menu. So you can look at the technical details, some of the editorial principles, information about how to download things. And also um, there's documentation of everything we've done and how we've done it. So we're kind of sharing, sharing all that information in case it's helpful for others doing similar projects. So that's all we've organized in terms of a formal presentation. The archive is still growing and changing. We add new texts and new functionalities as we as we discover them. And now that we've completed these two early phases of her career, uh, seeing how people use the archive in their classrooms and research is going to inspire us to do more with the archive. So please let us know how you're using it, what works, what doesn't, and if you'd be interested in involving your students or in collaborating with us. So now I just want to open the floor to questions. You can, you can type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask them directly, uh, whatever you prefer. You have to unmute yourself though. Are we allowed to, can, can people unmute themselves? I, I think they can. Uh, funding. Um, I had a grant from the Canadian government and I was supposed to be working on her sister, which I was, <laughs> but um, I kind of got distracted by this opportunity when it arose to work with Jean to kind of roll out an extension of her earlier project. So I had money from there. 
Um, and since then, um, I've had lots of sort of local support for my project from my university in terms of staff, um, students, that kind of thing. And also I'm applying for a, a bigger DH grant now. One thing that's arisen in the last sort of year is um, an SSAWW uh, uh, affiliated project of a digital discovery hub for American women writers and that project received NEH funding. So our project will be applying to be a cultivated project uh, with them and then we can learn um, more about how to meet the standards for digital scholarly editions. Thanks for that question, Lisa. Uh, Spencer had a question about the platform, but I think Joey answered it in his uh, message about the bespoke structure of the of the site. Any other? Yeah, I thought um, I actually thought it was interesting because we went around and around and around with this, and um, and I remember when we first started talking about it, um, I said I would love to have it be static. A static site and then I think initially we were thinking about using Omeka mm -hmm. and then the site was actually initially designed in Omeka and then we decided no this isn't working mm -hmm. I mean it was just this kind of and then you know and then Joey appeared like this knight on a <laughs> on a white horse <laughs> and knew what yeah. to do you know because mm -hmm. we were really wrestling with all these issues of how can it be sustainable uh, we were also dealing with the fact that it was uh, a multi-university co collaboration that was also multinational and it, you know it was just creating all these problems to try to like figure mm -hmm. out where to host it and things like that so mm -hmm. um, yeah so it was, it was definitely a big that was a big question that had to be solved mm -hmm. and and i should say that i'm a dh newbie so basically i had this little idea and I knew how to do literary recovery and I knew what was out there and how to do scholarly editing, but making decisions about how to structure the project, um, that was very difficult for me. So it was great to have Jean come on board and have a good sense of experience from other projects she's worked on. And then when Joey and Sydney came on board and they had experience with TEI and Omeka and uh, various textual editing projects, then we started making progress because we could really move ahead aided by their insights. Yeah, it was a really interesting collaboration, I thought, because, um, you know, people in different generations, I guess you could say, um, brought very different kinds of knowledge to the project. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, I had done these kind of like little, you know, I felt like I was kind of like building these little projects in my workshop in the basement or something, you know, and, um, and it was all just trial and error. But I actually learned quite a bit from working with uh, Jim Casey and Ben Lee at the Colored Conventions project. Um, so I just want to kind of mention them too, because they came and did a workshop at my university and um, talked a lot about like how to actually think about uh, sustainability and structure and how to organize information and organize the actual work that would go into a project. And that um, was something that that also fed into this as well. Yeah, um, some, uh, if you go, um, maybe can I just screen share for a minute again? Um, people are asking how to get involved. If you go to the um, about page, um, you at the very bottom, it talks about how you can contact us. And over the next week or so, we're gonna build more of a little Google form interface so that you can fill that out, tell us what you're interested in, and then we'll, um, we'll reach out to you and, and give, you, give you a project to work on. There are lots of ways that people can help. Um, Edley asked me if we plan on discussing Eaton, Edith Eaton. I, 
I thought this would be a little warm up uh, appetizer course, and then I would roll out a big project on Edith. But now that I've um, been working on Winifred, I, I think I'm going to take a break from Edith for a while. Um, although I have hundreds of texts that I need to share <laughs> by her that I haven't. Just write me offline and say, do you have any text about X? And I'll, I'll just email you some Winifred text that I've got in my little stockpile. I, I need a literary executor. I always feel like I'm going to die before I finish working on these, these people. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. Um, hi, Mary. Such a pleasure to meet you and Jean and all of you. Hi, Diana. Um, my name is Rena Heinrich and I'm an assistant professor of theater at uh, the University of Southern California. And I just want to say congratulations. This is so tremendous. I am a um, relatively new Winnie scholar, so I'm so happy to meet all of you. Um, and I'm interested in Winifred Eaton as a playwright. And so I just put that out to you and I, mm -hmm. I will um, go to the contact us as well. Um, I actually went to the archive and I tried to uh, look up plays and I, I didn't see them. Um, so I just, I just put that out there. I'm really interested in, um, I saw in the timeline that a Japanese nightingale was staged in Winnipeg. And so I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the tour of uh, a Japanese nightingale, not just the New York production, but what, what else happened to it. Um, and then I'm really interested in um, Winnie as the sort of one of the founding members of uh, Calgary's little theater movement. So um, anyway, so that's sort of where my research lies. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a mixed race scholar in performance um, sort of generally. And so that's what brought me to Winnie. And um, I really am interested in sort of um, reclaiming her as a mixed race playwright um, amongst all these other incredible um, hats that she wears. So anyway. Great. Thank you, Rena. Um, Thank you. You're the second person I've talked to about her, her theater writing in, this week. So there's a, a theater professional in San Francisco oh, who's wow. uh, interested in um, producing works by women of color. And she asked me, and I have to confess, until I dig to the bottom of the University of Calgary fawns. Um, mm. I have nothing to give you right now, except that Japanese Nightingale was adapted, but by another, by another playwright, not by Winnie herself. Mm -hmm. um, but, but stay tuned. I will keep you posted. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, someone asked if, it, it, will there be a discussion of Grace or Babcock today? No. On the timeline, yes, as we learn more. Grace Helen Hart, great Grace Helen Eaton Hart, uh, another Eaton sister, was one of the first Chinese American lawyers. And she left some papers behind at the Schlesinger about her legal career. And we'd we definitely like to look at those. And I don't know much about Winifred's first husband, uh, Babcock, but um, He's, he's part of the story. These, this writer is working in a network with others and collaborating, co-writing with people like her husband. So, yes. Okay, have I missed any questions? Yeah. Uh, Sandy. Yeah, my this is just so fantastic. I'm, I'm really glad you recorded it because I have to try to take more of it in than I have. But I'm wondering, since you've done this, um, you and the people you've worked with have done this just amazing job of creating a stable, let's hope permanent um, project. Is there any way that some of it can be adapted as people do similar projects on other people and even cross-referencing? I don't know. Yeah. Do you want to answer that, Joey? Because I think you, you can speak to how the code is is can be borrowed and can be adapted yeah sure um yeah all of our code everything that we've done actually is available totally open access on github um so all of our code and all of our texts are there um, and the associated tei schema um everything is there 
Um, it probably could be better documented. I've tried my best to keep it all documented. Uh, but um, yes, uh, the like short answer to your question is yes, that the uh, stuff that we've done can definitely be applied um, to another project. Um, the the less sort of uh, the longer answer is that the each of any sort of project is going to require so many uh, different sort of ways in which to approach um, a, a group of texts, and and so our code likely can't just be mapped um, onto any old sort of uh, archival project. Um, but mostly, what we've done in the in the creation of the code is following a large set of principles. Um, established by the University of Victoria's Endings Project. Um, they are a sort of a large scale project out of uh, University of Victoria who have been great collaborators. Um, that's where I did my undergrad and that's where I learned all sort of uh, how to do text encoding um, and, and these sort of DH projects. Um, and they've set out a set of principles as to how to create digital archives that are sustainable um, and, and uh, can sort of uh, persist um, in libraries, etc. Um, so I highly recommend that people interested in the platform development or how the how the infrastructure of the site works um, look at the endings project because they have really established um, uh, sort of theoretical and critical principles uh, that go beyond just a sort of set of code, but as a sort of um, methodology for creating sustainable archives. Thanks, Joey. And I think the digital recovery hub that Jessica Despain is heading um, aspires to kind of minimize the obstacles that uh, recovery scholars will encounter when they come up with projects like this. So uh, they will be um, uh, funding some um, consultations and assistance from people who are more technically oriented, who can uh, coach people who are more literary oriented. Okay. Um, all right. I think I think that's all um, all the questions we Mary. have. Yes. Mary, can I stop you? Yes. Um, so in the chat, we were just talking with Diana about potentially having her give her remarks again before we close the call. Right. Okay. Right. I was just going to say that. So, okay. so the, so the zoom call can be over if you want to leave now, if you haven't, if you heard Diana speak before, but um, you're welcome to stay if you didn't hear her speak before and we will stay on the call. We'll record this early part of the call so that we get Diana's um, comments again. And then we will, uh, you know, mess with the Zoom uh, recording so that we can have um, an archived version of this talk. So I just actually, want to thank everyone. Could I actually, could I interrupt you, Mary? Um, yeah, Jean. Because I actually would love for people to stay um, to hear Diana again. And I just, and have, okay. um, and the reason why is because I was at a conference where at the end of a presentation, everybody gave Zoom applause. Have you all seen this where you go like this? Okay. And I was thinking if we could do that and have our video on while Diana gives her remarks and then we could all give her a big hand. I would love for that. Yeah, to be okay. <laughs> well, I would say, I would recommend that we do a Zoom applause right now because some people are slipping away uh, to teach in three minutes, but we'll do another Zoom applause after Diana's um, repeat performance, okay? So how about um, a, a Zoom applause right now for, for Diana Birchall? <laughs> Thank you, Diana. All right. Shall I go? Thank you, everyone. Diana, um, I will introduce you again. So, um, so today, the Winifred Eaton Archive team will give you a tour of the archive and answer your questions. But before I go any further, I'd like to introduce our special guest, Diana Birchall author of Anato Watana, The Story of Winifred Eaton, who will say a few words about her famous grandmother. Thank you, Mary. 
I know it's just a coincidence, but it was exactly 20 years ago this month that my biography of my grandmother, Winifred Eaton, was published by the University of Illinois Press. I well remember my first anticipated book tour as an author being disrupted by 9-11. Now, I didn't know my grandmother. I have only one memory of meeting her when I was maybe four years old, and I insulted her by calling her my bad grandma. But the idea of her always intrigued me and it shaped my life. All I knew about her when I was growing up is that she was part Chinese, wrote books about Japan, and was a famous author. It was confusing. We seemed to have no points of contact, but she did leave me a few tokens. I like to think that one was the fairy germs, as she rather narcissistically called her desire to tell stories and her ambition to be a writer. More practically, she also gave me my career. For when I was a young single mother just out of, UC, out of CCNY and moved to California, her old literary agent helped me to a job in, as a reader or story analyst in the movie studios, which became my working world 40 years after, her, after Winnie's time in Hollywood. And when I got the opportunity to write the biography, I, I jumped on it with all the drive and energy that my grandmother used, it used to display seemingly hourly in her frenetic flamboyant life. And through the process of researching and writing, and in fact, learning how to write a biography, I was particularly aided by two then graduate students, Jean Lee Cole and Dominica Ferens, who formed with me a triumvirate, triumvirate of Winniers, as we called ourselves. Winnie took us on a ride and the adventure of a lifetime. But for me, most of all, I discovered, uncovered, and met my mysterious eccentric grandmother, and certainly the most thrilling project of my life, and the one I'm proudest of. Who was she? What was she like? Well, she came from poverty and had strong ambition to do great things, but I wouldn't say she had a plan. She chameleoned and flitted from one step to another as the winds of fortune and mishap blew, reacting and using her fertile, teeming brain, as she called it, to invent new ideas, new stories, new situations, and to live them. No biographer ever had a more fascinating subject. And that was the last gift token she left me. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me in um, applauding Diana's wonderful contribution here. Yeah. All right, everybody. Um, is there hey, anything Mary, can else? I interrupt you for a minute? I think yes. we should do the same for the entire presentation and project. Yes. It's really spectacular. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. You, thanks for all the contributors today, the people who've prepared and presented, and to all of you for coming and being so enthusiastic and encouraging. It'll keep us going. We'll, we'll get those final sections ready for you soon. Okay, thank Hi. you, everybody. I'm going Denny. to stop Hi, recording. Oh, hey. Hi, Elizabeth Rooney. Elizabeth, where Hi. is she? And Jim, this my is, brother. This is a weird way to see your cousin. Jim. <laughs> I've never met Jim. Is Jim there? I, I'm, yeah. I'm the black sheep of the family. He's oh. along with the fairy yeah, Jim. The rest of us are all dark gray. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. You're a wonderful family and so a family reunion and a winning reunion. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Fabulous. That's beautiful. All right, Diana, you were great. Yeah. That was a wonderful awesome. way to start the wow. the presentation. I'm so grateful that you could join us. I feel um, the whole 20 years, I really do. <laughs> you know, from novice biographer to the grease eminence of Winniedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we think of uh, when we think of you. We think of Eminence Gris. <laughs> Nobody else in the world does, but this community. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look at you. I see you. I see Elizabeth. And Jen, wow. <laughs> Who knew? This is beautiful. Why don't we do it normally? Why do we have to do it only in, in Can I just say event? on behalf of our family, this, was, this is incredible. 
I wish my dad were here to see it. I thought the same thing. Me too. Boy. Oh Me my too. gosh. Gosh, wouldn't he have, he would have just yeah. uh, blown his mind. The technology I think would have blown his mind if nothing else. Yeah. He always think... knew. He always said he knew the scholars would get around to Winnie someday. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Remember that? On it. Remember him saying that? He always said it. <laughs> Well, where's Frank? It, uh, I don't know. I, I think he's at a lake. He's, he's at a lake without technology. That's where he is. Yeah, I don't see him here today. You're at a lake, I, but look at you. <laughs> I have less technology than anybody else in my entire family. I guarantee it. That's why he's at my house. That's why I'm at Elizabeth's house. <laughs> hey, do you see Winnie in the back there? I just noticed. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I can't tell which picture it is. Well, that's the painting you had done. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. And um the, the the standard picture that's on the your your title page. It's always in every Rooney family home. <laughs> but thank you everyone. There we go. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Uh you, this was a, an amazing presentation and I cannot wait to explore the archive.